Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. I wanted to start with a quote from uh, a, an American writer I found uh, a good friend of mine when I've been doing these projects, James Baldwin, which is there on the screen. And it relates to my work, uh, speaks closely to my work. I'm I quote, it is always most terrifying, most dangerous, when elimination and erasure is done in the name of the public, or even worse, in the pretense of the protection of the public good. We've been given a topic, and I'm not going to criticize the topic because I've agreed to speak uh, at this conference, what to let go seems so poetic, on the one hand so open as it sounds, but I think so loaded a theme it is. Uh, for somewhere, we can get very easily caught up in difficult and grandiose subjects such as moral responsibilities. That, was what we all know, that, that's, that is what we all know from experience, and we also debated yesterday. We were here, witness to the debates yesterday, and how difficult it is. No one can be expected to do this task, this difficult task of de deciphering justice, at least not in easy terms. Attributing, redistributing justice is not a simple task. And it's also not a theme to be taken lightly, in my view. It can't be assumed to be a matter for easy answers. In the words of Nietzsche, before my highest mountain do I stand, and before my longest wandering road. Therefore, I must descend deeper down than I have ever descended. I'll be talking today about several of my projects that coalesced gradually to come under the title Archaeology of the Final Decade. It was a mouthful when I first came up with it, and it seems sort of mysterious and dramatic, sounding something like a, a fiction or a film like Raiders of the Last Ark or Close Encounters of the Third Kind. But I quickly realized that, although for me it had a very specific meaning, that it was actually open-ended enough that I could um, operate across a ver various projects without feeling limited. A lot of people thought that the final decade referred to the fall of the Berlin Wall, or 9-11, uh, or the end of the century, or actually one of the interesting ones was um, the decade before the advent of AIDS. When I heard that, I thought this is really quite abstract enough for me to be able to continue with it. And, um, but for me, and actually in the context of this <clears throat> very conference, What to Let Go, Archaeology of Final Decade, AOTFD as I call it, can be best explained as an impetus, an impulse, a process, and a method that came into being in order to excavate and focus attention on those amputated sections of culture that have been removed, obliterated, concealed, but now must be re-owned, reclaimed, repatriated, repatriated intraculturally in, within the culture if we are to make real sense of ourselves. AOTFD is an archaeology of repressions, of silences, of absences, of voids, and of particular blind spots of history. Its mission is to deliberately break the silence, to leak the repressed material, the dangerous to know, the threatening to the status quo, back into con consciousness, to reinsert the contested and silenced, the violated object or cultural artifact, back into the public sphere in order to subvert and dismantle, dismantle the fixed history as a necessary move towards a healthier sense of self. AOTFD approaches its material as dangerous supplements, if you like, that elucidate as much as they complicate and dismantle coherent, intact, unadulterated accounts of the past, a form of contamination. Relying on archeological forensics, AOTFD excavates, identifies, investigates, reclaims contested cultural and artistic artifacts and sites that have remained obscure, underexposed, endangered, 
in many cases banned or purposefully destroyed. Condemned histories. What does it mean to condemn a history? Iconoclastic destruction, linguistic and bodily censorship, the erasure of certain behaviors and traditions, the silencing of voices, experiences or perspectives, all entail the inevitable closure of future potential and possibilities. And ultimately, the freedom to create anew what might then have been a history. In identifying fragmented remains of what has been condemned to silence to the blind spots of history, we may also identify objects or artifacts whose own aesthetic power could give a voice, a resonance, autonomous from such specific politicized or social concerns. The cries of museums in Europe and elsewhere to expand and enlarge the canon readily welcome the retrieval, the inclusion, even the saving, in inverted commas, of those objects. They are perhaps less likely, though, to embrace the presentation of those objects in a socially or spiritually conscientious setting, or even less so, a politically agitational mode. What AOTFT focuses on is to ask how can we, at least in the way I work, on a sub-institutional level, work to exhibit those historic and artistic objects, both by exploring their aesthetic power and potency, while at the same time releasing them, deploying them to puncture, to interpolate, to inter interpolate even to disrupt a larger historical narrative. Quite aside from the personal risks involved when such narratives of condemnation are those enforced by totalitarian states, as some of my projects relate to, uh, there is this multi-directional or multi-layered curatorial impetus which wants to make possible, without diluting either imperative of approach what I mean is giving space to the aesthetic and formal presence of the work while at the same time consciously deploying it to activate history. Can we curate the mode in which these works are activated? Can we harness the performative dimension as they are leaked to re-enter the world stage? Can we multiply the spotlight of attention cast upon them into a constellation, a map of illumination whereby, for example, projects I'm going to talk about here, photographs of prostitutes taken by a photojournalist by the name of Kaveh Golestan can become an entry point through which we might clamor into the dangerous realms of contesting the contemporary state of civil rights in Iran. Or can reconstructing the landscape and aesthetic contents of the performances that shared a, a stage at the festival called Shiraz Persepolis elucidate us into the spirit of high aspirations of a high modernist moment where knowledge was exchanged across alternative and non-European plateaus, where it was possible to subvert the single reading of west to east into a more cyclical model, engaging in cultural negotiations from east to east, east to west, south to east, south to south, constructing a panoramic exchange of, of a global culture. I'm going to start with um, a, a, a short anecdote. This image here is the uh, building which houses the famous Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, which opened in 1976. And it opened to much acclaim and a huge amount of propaganda as the largest collection of international art outside of the main centers of collection in Europe and, and North America. In 2016-17, the museum has struck a significant deal to bring to, from Tehran to Berlin a major collection of artworks from the basements of the museum that they have been, they have, where they have been kept for 40 years, for the most part, unseen. I was recruited as a writer for the catalogue, but as the official catalogue was being overly controlled and censored by the state in Iran, I and several others had been recruited by the Berlin Museum to produce a shadow catalog, a parallel catalog to the official catalog. The museum curators in Berlin had become increasingly anxious that the official catalog would not be a suitable compendium to the exhibition. 
that it was far too controlled from unknown sources following a different and irrelevant set of agendas controlled by the Iranian state. So under the premise that they often produce more than one publication, a shadow catalog was planned without discussion with Tehran. A few months later, on the occasion of the opening, we gathered in Berlin as planned for the conference associated with the exhibition and found ourselves in an empty hall. The works of art had never arrived from T. Mocha, Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art. The exhibition had been announced, but had been canceled only days before. So we, as a contributor, sat there amongst the phantom of the exhibition that you see up there, uh, the ghost of the would-be exhibits that could have been there hanging on the wall. The exhibition was a great big blank void and the catalog was only the shadow unofficial one. This was a really a poignant moment, a fantastic phantom exhibition. What was monumental here was the absence of the exhibition. Here it was inevitable that the absence, the vacuum, the concealment, or the omission became more pertinent than the presence. And it had a potential to reveal a great deal about the actual, the, the actual and the real situation that we live in. The omission became more monumental than the would have been exhibition at that moment. And this related to my projects, and I was actually speaking about my projects there, so it was very interesting to be in this hall of an exhibition that was not, an, well, that was a blank exhibition. In dealing with silenced, absenced materials, aspects of my curatorial practice involve themselves primarily, but not exclusively, with issues pertaining to power, radical democracy, conflict, activism, and art and cultural projects, that evince social and political commitment. Over the course of time, it's become clear that those contested objects invariably cost, constitute sites of collective trauma, sites that have endured systemic and prolonged violence and that embody historical trauma. Below the surfaces, there lies a rich reservoir of knowledge ripe for release. Those materials and experiences that are released allow us to create infrastructures of knowledge, but what is knowledge? I'd rather call them infrastructures of collective experiences, infrastructures of aspirations, infrastructures of traumas, infrastructures of affects. So the projects embark on missions of destabilizing, demystifying, contaminating, subverting, and militating against fixed historical narratives and amnesias. It became clear that the absences we excavate are objects that embody collective trauma, areas that have subjected to systemic violence, and that they constitute the subterranean reservoirs of information containing what I would call zip files of information. Relying on archaeological forensics, AOTFT sheds light on the conditions and factors from geopolitical to social and psychological impending, obstructing the active engagement with the critical renegotiation of the past. This entails bringing into view sites that act today as microecologies of trauma and navigating terrains that have been marked by multiple ideological conflicts. The singular object is activated as a signifying <coughs> fragment. So the object slash site becomes a microspace determining the truth about the macro space of a bigger reality. The fragment comes to represent the whole, the micro representing the macro. The findings, so to speak, the objects as historical supplements, are hitherto uh, these repressed materials are imbued with the capacity to challenge and destabilize what has been imposed or accepted as an historical narrative. Important it is to say that far from espousing, however, a fetishistic admiration of the singular object, the approach to the material is to consider it and to pose it as a dangerous supplement that elucidates as much as complicates and dismantles the coherent, intact, and 
unadulterated account of the past. It's not the object and the fetish, fetish of the object that is as interesting to the process that I'm working with as how it can, as a fragment or as a microecology, elicit information or release information or leak information about a bigger reality. So the process tries to detach and unfasten the object from all their sentimental and oratic connotations, so to excavate and reveal the interrelations between the social, geopolitical, legislative, spiritual context of their making and their demise. It's in the, in the spirit of Walter Benjamin, the idea is to treat bygone and forgotten cultural forms and expressions as vehicles for exploding in the present. The ethical implications that come by with this kind of work are very interesting. Because returning to these sites leads to symbolically attributing or redistributing justice outside of the legislative system. Calling out the perpetrators by their name, recognizing the victim as victim. Attributing and redistributing justice is a valuable and necessary, as opposed to an incidental byproduct of the forensic process, audience is implicated as witness. Now I'm going to launch into the first project. So the first project was called The Utopian Stage, and it, the project unearths material that was pieced together from disparate sources and private basements and scattered storages, wherever I could find them, to conjure an archive of materials, audio recordings and film footages, writings, play scripts, catalogs, and articles that allow us to examine and articulate and critically appraise the landscape and genealogies of a decade-long radical festival of performance called Festival of Arts Shiraz Persepolis. This was held in Iran every summer between 1967 and 1977 in and around the city of Shiraz and the ancient ruins of Persepolis until it was declared decadent through a religious decree by Ayatollah Khomeini in 1977 and finally interrupted by the 1978-1979 revolution in Iran. Subsequently, all archives related to the events were destroyed and the materials associated with the festival were deemed un-Islamic and removed from public access and they remain officially banned in Iran. What was this festival performance that it had to elicit such an enduring violence against itself? Taking place at a time of radical shifts in global narratives and power dynamics in the wake of, the, of rapid decolonization and the height of the Cold War, the material excavated shows us the festival summoned a progressive dialogue of artistic perspectives echoing high ambitions of modernism and, and posing radically as a post-colonial intellectual project, proposing a cultural model that shifted the center of gravity of cultural production and politics towards the re-emerging other. This is one of the uh, images of the more recent exhibitions that uh, was mounted, as um, Cosmin said, at the Dhaka Art Summit 2018. I've prepared a collage that shows you the kind of breadth of material that came together in the festival. Oh, it doesn't have sound. Let's start again. Yeah?
outside Shiraz, who's host to the festival. My point of view is more um, sentimental than professional. I think that we should keep our traditional music. And, uh, of course, I think that the influence of the mu Western music will be inevitable. Um, in order to save some time, I'm going to rush through some of these, but um, I picked up, so picked up some themes as I've developed the exhibitions around different places. And this, uh, what, what, what becomes really interesting and very potent is this notion of the rise of solidarities. And as in institutions in the spaces where I work in, like as in Europe, they're interested in this business of modernities looking elsewhere, or modernities of the elsewhere, or other modernities, or alternative, or pl you know, plural pluralities against modernities, whatever. But it sort of fit, it fits in. You know, I've ended up being in the right place at the right time because here, really, in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, despite the rhetoric and despite the mythologies that were set against the festival, when you retrieve the material and look into it, you really realize that about, I, um, I have, I'll go forward and show you, there's this, yeah, I realized that um, what was called the West Toxicated Project, a project that money was thrown at Americans, actually had Iranians as the number one performers, and after Iranians, it had Indians as the number two performers. 
And um, you know, in the, in the absence of this knowledge, in the absence of information, of course, any myth can stick. And when you look at the, uh, the landscape of the festival, uh, you do understand that uh, the exchange with South Asia, East Asia, Central Asia, the Caucasus, Latin America, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa was so primal and fundamental to the, uh, to the dimensions of this festival, to the uh, drives behind the festival, that there's hardly really anything Western about it. In fact, the Westerners who turned up uh, many of whom were focused in Paris or in New York, and actually quite a few from different places in Poland, uh, because I may add that all communist countries were present at the festival, despite the fact that Iran at the time was heavily controlled as a kind of a CIA zone of political operation with its anti-communist um, agendas. Uh, that the, the Western and Eastern European, because there was the West Bloc and the East Bloc, and North American artists who came uh, were very specifically the ones who involved themselves with African and Asian modes of practice, of music, of, um, of, uh, of philosophies, and they had a very deep engagement with it. It was much less touristic than, than, than we could ever imagine. And um, so the, the space of the festival really becomes a very interesting nexus for modernizing nativists, i.e. those who worked in, let's say, Uganda or in Nigeria or in Iran itself or in India or Indonesia, who turned to native material as was very much the concern of the post-colonial moment in the global south, the euphoria of of reaching back inside, and this notion of the authentic, which is quite complicated and uh, not an easy one to unpack, but at least anyway, the compost, which is native, but with a, with a drive to modernize. They met in the landscape of this festival, they met up with modernists from Northern, uh, North America and East and Western Europe who were literally looking to ritualize. Jerzy Grotowski, for example, from, uh, from Poland, he really was very, very interested in uh, theater that retained a form of ritual, i.e. went back to its original strength, original spiritual str strength. And um, so the, the space of the festival really becomes a nexus for this sort of meeting. And of course, that the, 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 the avant-garde or the neo-avant-garde of the time become a conduit and a facilitator for this reverse transmission of knowledge. This is all, you know, these are all very big topics in themselves. Books can be written and have been written about these things. But the engagements, for example, that John Cage and Merce Cunningham had with uh, uh, the Book of Changes is, is, was very profound. It wasn't just a, a sort of bit of inspiration choreographies were created based on that. Music was created based on that. And um, I'll, say, I'll take us through some pictures. This is Yanis Zenakis, the R Greek origin, Romanian born, but Paris-based communist who had fought in the Civil War and lost an eye, or damaged an eye in Greece. He was a mathematician, an architect, and a composer. He was heavily involved in the, in the festival. Uh, these are Rwandan drummers who had come from Rwanda. They wore a sash which said Rwanda on it because they were so proud of being Rwandans as an independent country that left the country for the first time to perform on an international stage. This, this, these are images of Iranian traditional passion plays which had been appropriated uh, to study their devices as modern kind of Brechtian devices. Gamelan from Indonesia, Katakali from Kerala, the uh, Ballet National du Senegal that was set up after Sedar Senghor had taken power in Senegal, in independent Senegal, the same here. Uh, an image of an 11th century Iranian prose that was turned into a, a sort of a ritual performance. A bread and puppet theater from America who insisted on having street uh, parades for the people, 
and otherwise who always wore masks and distributed bread amongst the audience and they had a very hard uh, and serious sort of engagement with left-wing thinking and, and Marxist ideas. This is Jerzy Grotowski's production of uh, <coughs> Calderon's uh, The Constant Prince. This is uh, Nuria Espert who came from Spain with uh, Les Bonnes by Jean Genet directed by Victor Garcia, who was from Argentina, but based in Paris. And uh, she told me when I interviewed her that coming from Franco Spain, Iran's imperial Iran was mm, a breath of fresh air because Franco Spain was so uh, deafening and so repressive. And this was an interesting moment because of course, I, we have to remember that Southern Europe, Greece, uh, Spain, Portugal was, were under dictatorships. And then Eastern Europe had the issues of the so-called uh, Iron Curtain. This was an amazing project, which was a collaboration between many different nationalities and people. It was a kind of moment of kind of world theater. Peter Brook, Ted Hughes, Arby Ovanesian, Jeffrey Reeves, four different directors, uh, happened uh, in, in the ruins. I'll zip through these, but the images, of course, are very epic, really epic, uh, happening at sunset and sunrise, uh, linking to ancient traditions in Asia and elsewhere where lots of rituals happen at sunrise or, sun, or sunset or on particular days. This uh, shows also a bit of the public. It's a piece called Mantra by Stockhausen, which was performed in a courtyard in the bazaar in Shiraz. And the, the planks you see on the lake is a is a kind of ode to a traditional form of Iranian commedia dell'arte where the central ponds in the houses would just become a stage, a makeshift sh stage by putting planks over them. The piece itso is, itself is called Mantra. Um, Stockhausen was deeply interested in, in Hinduism. Here he is himself. This is an image of the crowd. You can see very young people. It really attracted a lot of university students and people who didn't have access to leave Iran, even though it was initially a very kind of bourgeois project in the first year, by, by the second or third year, it, it really used to attract the kind of young and those who really wanted to have access to the world. This is uh, Merz Cunningham, this is John Cage. This is another performance by Stockhausen because he had a, a kind of a quasi retrospective. They performed many of his pieces in one, one year. This is uh, an image of Car Mountain by Robert Wilson, who was very young at the time and produced a show that lasted 168 hours. It started from Friday and ended up ended the next Friday. Oh, the, the, the shark you saw was part of this performance in the film. And also the other black and white of a very, very slow moving character who kind of, I think in, in, re in real terms, spends about 25 minutes walking through a pool of water to the other side. Um, there, yeah, there were I think 700 characters, 500 of them were cardboard. And this is Shuji Terayama. Shuji Terayama, I don't know if you know about him, but an incredible uh, producer of uh, performances and films. Uh, they actually did a piece at Tate Modern, some of his works at Tate Modern in the Turbine Hall. He's uh, Japanese and he's really the only, interestingly enough, he's the only Asian um, who uh, belongs to the international avant-garde. So all the Asian performances are mainly ritual and tradition and, and as are the Africans, even if they are appropriations of the native material, but Shuji is really in a different scale and a different kind of um, dialogue. Theater Stu from Poland. Uh, this is an Iranian performance of uh, Albert Camus' Caligula. Uh, the scenography here was incredible. Uh, it was a series of runways and the public sat in, in, the, in the voids in between the runways. So when it was side lit, you had a sea of severed heads. Scenographically, it was really amazing. This uh, is Kechakrina. Uh, how is it going to play? Let me see. I, I think I can do it. Um, directed by Sardono Kusumo from Indonesia. He performed a dance with the people in Tegas village in Bali.
Um, I'm going to move quickly forward. What we did at the Dakar Art Summit is that we um, also had the opportunity to create an amphitheater, which we called it a roving amphitheater, so it can kind of move like an old circus and prop it, itself up in any village or city uh, it may land in. And uh, we had performances commissioned by contemporary artists uh, to respond to the spirit of the festival. So here we had um, Hassan Khan, who produced a, um, a sonic piece, Goshka Makuga, who did a piece with myself, Silas Reiner, who uh, did some work from, on behalf of the Merce Cunningham Trust, Ritu Sattar, who did a piece with uh, the Harmonium, She's a uh, Dhaka-based artist, and then that was presented at the Liverpool Biennial. Yasmin Jahan Nupur, another uh, artist based in Dhaka. And we also had Santal performers and Lalon Baal singers. So we had traditional performers from, from different areas of, uh, of, uh, of Bangladesh. And the Baal singers basically would sing if and when they felt like it, at sunset. So we included them in the, in the project and we allowed them to make their choice if they wanted to, to, to perform or not. And they, of course they did perform actually. So these are different images of the kind of, some form, not reenactments, but kind of in the spirit of, and there was also a film program in the spirit of the festival of the 60s and 70s, which included films from contemporary artists, artists from the 80s, people from like Rose Finn Kelsey, um, if you've heard of her, or Rose English, uh, and uh, Parajanov, and uh, uh, William Greaves, Shazad Davood. And, uh, but this was an interesting moment because uh, a cultural atlas was produced uh, for, which we have copies of outside on the table because Diana Campbell Betancourt sent send it very kindly to us so that we could have it as part of this uh, conference. But anyway, this culture atlas was very important because it, it allowed us to zoom out of the festival and to explore the reverberations of 20th century modernist universalisms and address this notion of the universalist ambition. So uh, here uh, we basically, I used the, this moment of Shiraz here you see, and the kind of different people who came there as a kind of a, one of the constellations. And as you move around, it gets wider and wider. And um, there were so many, there are so many connections between these transcendental and universalist ideas, which are very cyclical. And uh, according to some Oriental theories, Japanese theories, Asian theories, they kind of uh, live along a vertical time. A very interesting concept I came across, which is basically time that's not accounted for in a linear fashion, such that something very archaic can exist, coexist with something which is very now, which is very, which is very present. And um, I really wanted to show the connection with um, yeah, the non-aligned movement, because I think the spirit of the festival was very much in line with the non-aligned movement. And, uh, of course, the Iranian Revolution is one of the moments of the end of the non-aligned movement. Iran was actually meant to be part of the non-aligned movement. It did, um, Mossadegh, the Prime Minister, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, was very much in touch with the uh, different, uh, several handful of leaders who were, uh, who were significant in creating the Bandung Conference and then the non-aligned movement. But, of course, the 1953 coup the American CIA coup in Iran put Iran in a different position. But the festival really, really follows the purview of the non-aligned movement and the spirit of the non-aligned movement. And the Islamic revolution in Iran is really one of the moments of the end of any of that kind of dream. So I wanted to include that, which I thought was very important. And of course, Pan-Africanism, the Festival of Arts Shiraz Persepolis was very much in dialogue with the first Negro Festival of Arts uh, in Dakar and also the Pan-African Festival in, in Algiers and then coming further back. Um, incredible how ideas from Lalon Fakir or of course Tagore travel around the world, go backwards and forwards. I actually couldn't do all the lines of connection because it would get very, very messy, too many lines. So it had to be somehow a bit chronological. What I'm trying to do is to raise some money and work with um, some digit digitally savvy people to create a kind of projected version of it where 
uh, places can come up and go down, so that even as a viewer, you're forced to perform a kind of going backwards and forwards to really embody the cyclicality of these ideas, because it really was, it really isn't linear, and it really isn't uh, isn't um, one di one directional. So that was the end of that, and I wanted to quickly then um, share with you this other project, this recreating the citadel, which. Uh, is really about cultural deterritorialization and re-territorialization as a, as a tool of political and cultural reordering of society. This image that you see here show, is from Abbas, the Magnum photographer. It shows a charred, a charred body of a, of, of a human who is a woman. Uh, you can see a head and shoulders and torso, hips, knees. And um, it's allegedly a, a picture of one of the women prostitutes who was burnt to death when the red light district of Tehran was burnt to death. So the project follows the history of the red light district back from the 20s. And I'll, I'll take it forward quickly. And the story of the discourses of natural rights and how the emancipation of women in Iran in, this, in, this, in the 50s, 60s, and especially in the 70s, really shifted attitude towards the prostitutes and the site of prostitution and the body of the prostitute to something much more compassionate. And um, I'll show you, have I got 10 minutes, five minutes? Time's up, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll skip through that film. So these were the images of, that I recovered from the archive of Kaveh Kolestan, who's deceased. These were taken in 1975, 1977 of the prostitutes of the, of the district. And in the exhibition, the idea was not to only display the art object, but also to contextualize it and to continue its history through the destruction of the area which happened two days before the arrival of Ayatollah Khomeini. And the area was burnt down and I recovered the newspapers and the articles that documented it because it's not very well documented otherwise. People could not remember when it was done. And then that led to information about the execution of the prostitutes which uh, became a very important piece of information because they are the first women to be executed by the Islamic courts of law in Iran. And later I discovered that they, in the 20th century, one woman was condemned to death through the Iranian judiciary until 1979. And since 1979, the initiation of women's execution, which was done by the prostitutes, has led to uh, executions of 40 to 60,000 people in Iran. And Iran has the highest number of executions per capita anywhere in the world for the last decade. And the area now looks like this. So uh, this deterritorializing, as it was burnt and then finally demolished and destroyed, has been re-territorialized um, in a very typical manner of a totalitarian state where the scars of the, the violence is removed, but also the scars of the violence are removed and replaced by something wonderful and healthy. And you see geese and ducks and people with boats floating around and sort of underneath there's another history. This, these are the sort of documents that go with the exhibition. This is the exhibition that Tate Modern bought and it became the first room to an Iranian artists at Tate Modern, they insisted in having the information, but they showed only that much of it. And talking about what to let go, I thought I wanted to share that with you. So that's what it should be, that's what it ended up being. It eliminated all the information about executions <coughs> and the burning. Uh, and these images, which are the last four images, are another project that document the uh, women's demonstrations in 1979 against the imposition of the veil in Iran, which continues today. Thank you very much. <laughs>